Hello and welcome to this segment of Arts Talk. I'm Sherry Burr and my guest for this segment is Max Evans, the legendary author. Welcome, Max. Thank you. It's great to see you. Uh, I'm, glad, I'm glad I'm here. <laughs> and Max, we're here with, with several of your books and the one that came out most recently, I believe, is War and Music, right? Yes, ma'am, that's true. Okay, so why don't you tell us a little bit about the story of War and Music? Well, I think I titled it wrong to start with. It oh. has a subtitle called A Medley of Love. Right. And it's a far bigger love story than it is about war. Uh -huh. And, uh, but th this gentleman uh, who's my hero, if you want to call him that, he's just an ordinary person. But uh, he was ter had a terrible concussion. Mm -hmm. And since I'd experienced that, I always sort of wanted to uh, give give just a little idea of how through nature and a natural life mm -hmm. that the concussion can be helped, and especially what's happening to the young men and women right now. Right. So I, I wanted to do it in, in a fictional form and uh, have a better chance of touching these people. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the treatments, there's specific treatments for this, this terrible injury. Uh, but life itself is a treatment, mm -hmm. and that's what happened in my book to this young man. Mm -hmm. he, he was not aware. Uh, he, he found himself in a great French uh, estate mm -hmm. that had been spared from this huge army, the American army, many divisions, the French, the Canadians, and they were all trying to conquer Hitler mm -hmm. and his regime and consequently literally save the world. <clears throat> well, he gets a terrible concussion. All of this I'd experienced, so I wrote that, but it, it's brief in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, the war is a brief part, but I tried to make it the, the real gut truth so the, the reader could experience the recovery that happened. Mm -hmm. And he, he discovers this estate right off of the front lines in battle that had been spared because the Germans had used it as a headquarters. Mm. And these people, these French people, royalty in, 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 in fact, in that manner, uh, were, were still there. Mm -hmm. And he just stumbled into them. And uh, right after they, they, they were freed, this, this particular state was spared because they, uh, the, the American intelligence wanted to, uh, to, to acquire uh, the, the, the German papers that might be left behind or any kind of evidence that would help in the war effort. So everything was spared. All of a sudden he's all crazy and his head all busted up. And, he, and here's this wondrous estate. He just stumbles into it, and he thinks, my God, I'm in, I'm in, there is a heaven. Mm -hmm. I'm into it. And uh, he, he just fits in somehow mm -hmm. through the music. He, he, he wasn't a musician. He was sort of like me. He was a musical idiot. But mm -hmm. th these people were uh, captivated and, in fact, involved deeply in classical music. So he just joined right in because his grandfather had been a, a classical mu music lover. And then the natural part of life there on the estate, bringing it back, the farming, the, the, the sheep, the cattle, uh, the, the stable of horses. Uh, you have the peasants over here and the royalty over here, and yet all of a sudden they realize that because of it being spared that they're actually the same. Their mm -hmm. blood, their souls are all the same. And by the nature of just being involved in the farming and riding their horses, and, and in fact, just a little thing like feeding the chickens. Mm -hmm. But I remember that from my childhood, and, and even when I was a young adult. I, I, no matter what happened, I, you, wherever I was on a ranch, I'd always volunteer to feed the chickens. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, I took a lot of beef on that on occasion. It so like it, it's through this the nature of enjoying nature and it being involved in the music and uh, uh, the animals of all kinds, the birds. Uh, they had a little stream with fish 
all these things that, that, that uh, are there right now every day for everybody to, to, to touch some way or other if they want to. And that's what I wanted to project in this besides a beautiful love story. Mm -hmm. There's several beautiful love stories. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I thought people would get the cover uh, and realize it wasn't dominated by war. Ah, because on the cover, you you show the you know the World War II GI soldier, but you also show this woman and the the music, almost to show that the music and the love are more important than the war story. I thought the cover would show it, and that uh -huh. was my mistake. I should have I should have had my utilized my uh, subtitle. Uh, is a head title, a medley of love. Just uh -huh. left it that. People would have been intrigued uh -huh. of all ages. But war right now with war everywhere mm -hmm. and uh, the, the enormity of fear in the whole of civilization or uh, non-civilization, if you want to put it that way too. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there you are. Right. And, and, and love is pre far predominant in the book and, and, and in salvation of any, any, any group of uh, people it, under any du duress, love always triumphs, if there is a triumph at all. Right, right. That, well, that's a wonderful kind of moral to the story. And it sounds like you use your own experiences uh, ha in your novels. So you use the experience of being in, in the war uh, World War II, you've used the experience of growing up on a farm. Uh, you wrote a, another book called it For the Love of a Horse, mm -hmm. where you wrote all these horse stories based on your own experience. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, do you find that that's common? We know that the saying for writers, write what you know, that it's that, that, that your own life is has been your biggest teacher. You know, I, I never source. thought about that. I'm sure all that's true, and there's a thousand philosophies, and I've heard uh, at least to, Ten times that many, uh -huh. but uh, I, I just uh, I just write whatever I'm feeling at the time, uh, okay. become obsessed with. It, it happened to be horses. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd had many horses throughout my life, mm -hmm. and uh, they, you know, there's an old cliche. Cliches are cliches. Uh, that b b they're true, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the truth. So they become cliches. Truth always becomes a cliche, a great truth. And uh, there's an old saying, an ancient old saying, that there's nothing as good for the inside of a man as the outside of a horse. Oh, really? Yeah. Mm. It, it, that's been forever, ever mm. since there's been a, a great association mm -hmm. with horses and, and humans. Right. Yeah, if you think, even, even just take a slight thought of history, mm -hmm. uh, what would we, where would we be without the horse? Right. I mean, we had no, uh, there were so many years, just uh, a mule is the most dominant and, and giving of all animals to, to, to humanity. Mm -hmm. But they're half horse. Right. You know, they don't exist without man, oddly enough. So they, they have to mm -hmm. negotiate the breeding between them. Right. And most recently, we have a horse story that's nominated for an Academy Award, War mm -hmm. Horse, mm -hmm. um, set again uh, well, in World War II about this love of a horse and, and between the horse and his uh, owner and the owner searching and finally finding the horse in the, in the midst of the war. And yet it tells a really powerful tale of the horse's adventures. And you yourself have written stories, like one of my favorites is from this little book called um, Xavier's Folly and Other Stories. Um, you have this uh, story where you get into the mindset of a cow and a coyote. Do you study these animals and you start to think, what is the coyote thinking? What is the, the uh, cow thinking when you get into the mindset of an animal? Yes, ma'am, I suppose I did. Uh... I hunted coyotes uh, when I had a little ranch over in Union County, and I, I, I was surrounded by big ranchers, mm -hmm. and I knew I could never expand, and I was going to be out to make, actually, I couldn't uh, make a living with my own cattle. Mm -hmm. I, I just could make a half living, so I, I'd work out, and uh, these bigger ranches around me, what they call day labor, and uh, I, I hunted coyotes. <clears throat> I made a deal with the ranchers because they were losing a lot of calves in that mm -hmm. time. And 
I, I, I studied them just by nature, uh, my own nature. Mm -hmm. And uh, I realized that they were more intelligent than I was, by far. Really? And they didn't have to have books or television or cell phones. Mm -hmm. They could, I, I literally was up on a mesa once and witnessed two coyotes. Uh, one of them was after a rabbit and there was a promontory, a hill probably at, oh, 500 feet, probably mm -hmm. tall, but it's very wide. And one coyote was on one side and the other one was slowly running the rabbit around the other. Mm -hmm. And that coy I knew that this coyote here could somehow, without anything magical, visible, mm -hmm. sensed exactly where that rabbit was because mm -hmm. it, it was slowly turning its head and all that massive mountain before it. Mm -hmm. And just exactly right, it took up the chase and caught it. Wow. And I watched things like that over and over and over. Mm -hmm. And I realized, uh, I, I finally got to where I couldn't, I, I quit hunting him. I quit killing him. Never, never again. Oh, because you had so much respect for yes, their intelligence. Yes, I couldn't help it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I just, yeah, it, it's, it's in one of my stories. Hmm. I, I fictionalize it, but it's a story called Old Bum about an old dog. But it, it tells us coyote uh, hunt where a, an incident happened that I could never, ever, ever kill one again. Hmm. And uh, I never did all after all those years. Oh, so when people see two coyotes together, but they... hey, to answer your your your, your question a little better, please mm -hmm. forgive me. Okay. I rambled on there. That's that's writers have that that problem when you ask them a question, they give you a long answer. Uh, the 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 absolute totality of of that story is a triangle of tragedy mm. because. This old mother coyote has to feed her pups. Right. And it's very difficult. She has to kill something to feed her pups and keep them alive. The mother, mm -hmm. the mother instinct is as hard and big and great as grand as it can possibly be thought of. The old cow is having her last calf. Mm -hmm. She's old and she's been through all these wars and survived with wild animals and man and the elements of light. She's even being struck by lightning. One of her horns is split. And she's gone to water, and the, the coyote is spotting her pups because she knows, oh, that's an old cow, uh -huh. and she's going to have a calf. Uh -huh. She knows all these things. She doesn't have to read it. She doesn't have to hear it. She right. just knows right. life and death, and here I can feed my calves. The old cow senses that she's being surrounded. Mm -hmm. So she moves up out of there as far as she can get and turns to face it. Mm -hmm. And an old, old cowboy who's, who's uh, uh, on his last run, and his job is to look after the cattle no matter what. That's mm -hmm. his job. And he's been a hand so many, many years. And there, here they come together. Mm -hmm. And in the instant of life and death, which happens to all of us one time or the other, one way or the other. Maybe not this dramatic or maybe more so. But she has the calf, she's licking the calf, she knows the old coyote's there, and she turns to face it. She takes care of her calf the best she can, and the coyote is waiting for her to get weak. Mm -hmm. The coyote knows she's mm -hmm. going to weaken mm -hmm. because she's had the calf, she's old, she, she can't eat now, she can't drink, She's and the sun's beaming down, and this old, old cowboy on his last run witnesses this and knows what's happening in an instant. Mm -hmm. So he gets off his horse, gets his rifle, and he crawls up there to watch the end of this. Mm -hmm. And when the, uh, I give away my story, of course, but it all comes together and I'm not going to give away my story. Okay. Somebody somewhere might actually want to read it. Yes, I, I think it's a fabulous story but, because you get into the mindset and you make us feel and understand what the coyote is thinking and what the cow is thinking. I mean, I think it's genius, actually. Well, thank you very much because that's my, I, that's my favorite story of all, all my long life. Really? Yes. Word for word, that's the best I can do. And I did it very early in my my writing career, I think about is about the fourth or fifth 
uh, work book. Uh, mm -hmm. It was published as a book, even though it's really short. Right. You know, one of your most famous books um, deals with the High Low Country, and the High Low Country was turned into a film by director Stephen Frears. Uh, I want to pause for a moment and show the audience a clip, and then I want to talk to you about the High Low Country. Mine's a true story. It started back when things were a good deal simpler than they are now. Hey, Pete! You half-brained dog, get out of here! Hanging with Big Boy taught me what fun was all about. <laughs> well, it's hard to count all this money, but it's $467. I'm getting wild like I promised you. Chasing women, raising every kind of hell. It was all good times. What'd they do to you in the army? Take the cowboy ride out of you? And it started over Mona. Ran into her the day I got back. Started with a little small talk about the weather and then... <laughs> I want to run away with you someplace where no one can find us. Go on getting Mona back here. He's my best friend, and there ain't nothing I wouldn't do for him. Your friend is stealing a man's wife. Don't look at her, you know she's worth the risk. Hell, risk may be the best part of it. If somebody's gonna gun him down, I don't intend to let that happen. Times get hard. I see you boys coming begging. What about I stomp enough out of you to fertilize Texas? Les Burke is gonna kill Big Boy. And I'm gonna have to kill Les. Big Boy! With that kind of love, nothing else matters. Not the law, not what people say, and not consideration for life or death. No! Hey! So let's just talk for a second about how the High Low Country came about. I, I assume this came from personal experience, right? And mm -hmm. you were the person who named this area of New Mexico the High Low Country. Yeah. 